Thank you very much, gentlemen. I might say that I'm a proud member of the Wayne Nature Center. I couldn't be more uh, encouraging to others to be as enriched as I've been. Uh, first of all, thanks for the privilege of uh, getting an opportunity to talk to your members and your guests. Uh, and uh, I tell all my classes when I begin that uh, it may be that you think I'm trying to be a comedian, you know, because I'm interested in lightening my talks up, but uh, not really. If I have a reputation as being unsuccessfully funny, but the deal is that uh, this particular topic happens to be a pretty grim, one, right? And I write in the book that if I stuck to my original thoughts, that was to write about objective principles and data uh, about what we know about this issue, uh, it would really be a great read. So, so the book is filled with um, uh, a lot of uh, what I call human interest uh, topics. And so if you get a chance to read it, which I highly recommend, and what I'm going to do tonight is that I'm going to provide an overview on the topic sort of slides that I'll show you, which I'll go through relatively quickly, but they'll outline the topic, the threat that glass, sheet glass, and plastic have in the form of windows and human structures to birds. And then I'll go through at the end, a little summary of the chapters. And some of it will be a review, and some of it hopefully, it'll stimulate me to remember something that I didn't talk about in the overview. So I have a lot of, uh, uh, and by the way, you know, I write in the book at the end, who knew people who write books and want to get them published in a very high image publisher, like even Island Press or uh, Simon and Schuster or Harcourt and, uh, and, and Howard Mifflin, you have to have an agent. They won't talk to authors. And actually people who told me about this recommended some agents and I contacted them and I thought, you know, they would be eager to publish something about this topic, having such a wide reach around the world. But they said, uh, no, they, they didn't think any of these big name publishers would be willing to invest in that because they wouldn't get any return on their investment. But they said, this is a perfect topic for a university press. So I had again some contacts and I contacted the university presses and I got the same thing. And I'm like, we just don't think we're going to get our money if we invest in it. And this particular publisher, the one that this book is called Hancock House, is a very small publisher in Scurry, British Columbia. And they told me from the very beginning, because another author told me about them, that they believe in the topic. And even when the technical reviewers looked at my manuscript, they all said, Hey, Dan, you got to get a higher image press. You can't go with these little guys in British Columbia. And I tried. And what did the little guy in British Columbia say? They said, Oh, no, Dan, you know, we believe in the topic. You go find yourself a higher image press. We'll, we'll release you from your contract. And I tried, you know, with a number of different sources. And they all said, No, they don't think they're going to make any money on it. So sorry. And they agreed to publish it, and that's how I ended up staying with them. I said I was so grateful. Now, there are a lot of university presses. I could have probably spent my life trying to plead with them to publish it, but I decided that I've been studying this issue for 47 formal years, getting almost to a half century, and waiting any longer didn't seem like a good idea. So I wanted to do it. And so what is this book, and what is this topic? This is something that I am attempting yet again with this latest issue to educate as many people as I probably can to touch somebody who has influence, who could influence people who are in power to design and guide the human built environment. Buildings, there's, there's, except for perhaps some you know, African hut someplace, there's really very little structures that we humans build don't have windows in them. And everywhere there are windows, you have the potential of this tragedy taking place. Birds just don't see glass. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a bit. But the bottom line is, is it's all over the world. It's happening everywhere. And uh, we need to be responsible stewards of our planet and this particular organisms. And again, I'll give you some detail as to justification. 
So this is the publisher's name, Hancock House. Uh, if you if you uh, Google that, www will come up with all their line of books, and they prominently feature this one because it's new. So here's some nice pictures of birds. They usually start off, so you all I'm sure seen this many times. And um, here's some typical habitat that you'd see in somebody's backyard. Here's a, a, a classic example of a picture window in somebody's house. You know, the thing is that when you hear about this issue of birds crashing into windows, like in the last two weeks, for example, maybe it's been a little longer, that time flies by very fast for me these days. So it may have been three weeks or even four weeks, but there was an incident in Philadelphia. There was another incident in New York City where hundreds of birds were killed flying into the glass facade of a high skyscraper building. Now this particular topic almost always gets attention in cities from, because that's where the birds are very evident when they die, they're on the sidewalks. And they're turned into reporters who live in those cities and they write about them. But the sort of little secret is that, and the, I don't want to say dirty little secret, but the, but, but the bottom line, the hidden secret, is that most kills throughout the entire year take place at homes, residences, people's houses, and small little commercial buildings. A study a few years ago that was published pointed out that 44% of all the birds killed at windows, which are estimated to be 365 million to 1 billion every year. That works out to be 1 million birds dying every day in the United States. And like I like to point out, you know, why aren't we hearing about this? So again, I was talking to Mr. Buse here, uh, just a little while ago when I was pointing out that, look at, uh, you know, I thought the media is going to take advantage of this. This book has been released after two months and not hardly had any interest whatsoever. Now, maybe it's the climate conflict. Maybe it's the horrific weather conditions and the mudslides and, uh, and the water that's taking place in the Pacific Northwest. Maybe it's other problems. And maybe they're waiting for a clear time in the future to talk about it. I hope so. But my point is, when we do hear about, from the media, especially the national news, of uh, environmental threat, it's oil spills just about everywhere, right? So in my very first publication where I addressed how many birds were being killed nationally in 1990 in a scientific paper, I pointed out that my low figure was 100 million and my upper figure was a billion. Now, annual kills. If you just take the low figure, you need 333 Exxon Valdez every year to equal how many birds are being killed in windows, but nobody's talking about windows. They're talking about oil. And again, I also write in the book, look, I'm not asking people to choose. I'm not asking them to think about this threat that birds are exposed to as something more important than any other threat. They're all important. We should be working on all of them, whether it's wind turbines or anything else. And the other thing I like to point out too is that although there's a broad spectrum, every bird on the planet is subject to this potential threat this lethal uh, exposure. Uh, but there might be some sources of avian mortality that are disproportionately more important. Like, let's take birds of prey, right? Their populations are not as big as many of the passerine birds that get killed in these windows. And they might get disproportionately a greater attrition affiliated with wind turtles than other species might, right? So we need to be attentive to the relative value and scale. But scale does matter. And I'll, I'll talk about that. So here's a Yellowthroat and Muriel that showed up at that window that you saw here. Uh, these guys aren't really very abundant, even on migration through here, but one showed up as on the dead list. This particular layout is something that takes place in Toronto every year um, in the spring and the fall. Uh, volunteers in the city of Toronto collect all these dead birds and then they go to the uh, Toronto uh, Royal Ontario Museum, and they, and they lay them out. They lay them out in, uh, in Government Hall, uh, City Hall, a couple of times as well. Uh, but they make a big deal out of this. This was so impressive. The National Geographic magazine one year took a picture of this and used it as their promotion for their magazine. So, you know, it makes quite a, quite a, uh, a statement. The kinds of claims that I'm going to be sharing with you and trying to explain uh, this this topic of, of windows and how it affects birds. Uh, this is based on, as I said earlier, gathering observation of information for over almost half a century, right? I've also conducted detailed monitoring 
with the help of homeowners who lived and worked in their houses for, in one case, about one and a half years, and another case, two years. And in that particular piece of information, I was able to ask questions about this a matter of the orientation of the window and where birds get hit. This a matter about the season of the year. It's a matter of the time of day. You know, when do these events occur? And the people that lived and worked there, because that's what happened. These people volunteered because they worked in their homes. They were writers, brothers. And we numbered all their windows and we monitored every strike that took place. We did relationships with bird feeders and other things. So there was a lot of detailed questions you could ask about the natural history of events of these animals and how they're being affected by uh, this, uh, this character of these windows. And then experiments. Experiments were very important to confirm that birds really behave as if windows are invisible to them. Also, experiments were important in trying to address deterrence. What could we do to prevent them, right? So this is all some of the fundamental work that went on. And this topic was my topic in my doctoral dissertation. So I started studying this formally in January of 1974, and I finished my degree in 1979, and uh, I've been writing about it ever since. Uh, it, again, in the book, I don't make a real big deal about this because some of my technical editors, when they're looking at the original manuscript, interpreted some of my explanations as sort of sour grapes. What do they mean by that? Well, you know, I was pointing out that the struggle to get my copies that were the main editors of these morphological journals, uh, you know, they, they would turn my manuscripts back and tell me that this topic was unsuitable. And I, it, would, it would bother me because I, I, I thought, as a student, I was told that everything is suitable for scientific but not this, apparently. And so it was a struggle getting them to listen. It took a while, it took again, almost, almost 10 years. But eventually, and I remember very naively, you know, look at, uh, this is so new, people are unaware of this. I'm exposing a conservation issue that should be on everybody's forebrain. They should be working to try to solve this problem. And uh, so when I sent my first manuscript off to science, our most prestigious North American scientific journal. It came back in three days, unsuitable topic. And then I tried the major orthological journals, same thing. I got so bad that later on, I kept on asking editors, I'm not even going to submit my manuscript if you, unless you tell me you're going to send it out for review. And finally, I got some traction. And now I'm very proud of the fact there's a whole suite the whole couple of young scientists who thought this was important enough to be studying it. Uh, not the least of which was a group in the Smithsonian Institution a number of years ago, who a postdoc was hired to look at all the objective sources of human caused mortality in birds. So cats, wind turbines, roads, windows. And they came up with a number of manuscripts. And, you know, in science, we always learn uh, an experience. If you build a better mousetrap today, the guy who built the one before you was forgotten. And so, mercifully for me, I've still managed to hang on because the things that I've published and the new reports that are coming out tend to continuously validate what my original findings were. And so, what were they? Let me talk about this. So, here's the cast of characters of Million A. Well, you know. 12.5% of all the birds, 10,500 species of birds thought to be in the world, 12.5%. Why, why not the rest of them? Well, most of them don't live in the Russian dwellings, right? But get this, I have a record of a hardcore stone petrol, which is out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, hit a boat window that was in station, was the stationary. So again, I argue over and over again that wherever you have birds, wherever you have glass, you have this potential mortality factor. And here's the deal. As I re remind everybody, we're not them and we never will be. You know, they, meaning the birds. You know, the, so what do we have to do? We have to rely on studies that have revealed the details of their visual systems. What's the wavelengths of the electromagnetic waves that they get, their visual system and their brains can see? How do they respond to them? What about the placement of the eyes on their head? Does it matter that they Looking more laterally, some species are looking more in front. Of course, it matters. And what is the range of 
visual cues that they're able to see that we don't. And uh, ultraviolet light, for example, is a classic example. Your lens absorbs ultraviolet light, the bird's lens lets it go through, and it has a cone cell on the back of its retina that has a special pigment that picks up ultraviolet light. And the other more important thing, in addition to knowing about the details of the visual system, is their behavior. How do they behave around windows? And what do we do to the windows to try to transform them into barriers that they'll see and avoid? All of those things are what we use to interpret what we think birds are seeing. And that's what I've been doing in my studies and my research. In North America, 30% of the birds that we know about here, I haven't put cats on this particular list. And that study I referred to earlier that looked at all the comparative work of different threats to bird life, uh, cats were number one. They were given a billing of killing, you know, 1.5 billion birds a year. But here's the deal. I've actually published papers to show that there's a whole cadre of scavengers that regularly patrol areas underneath windows to collect the dead and die. And cats are a big part of that. So are dogs, so are skunks, so are raccoons. And get this, so are chipmunks and so are squirrels. They learn. And not only that, the way we humans place plantings around our windows and in front of our buildings, they tend to hide the dead and they hide the animals that get injured because they'll seek out any injured animal to be got some place to hide, so it will be trying to protect it. So these kinds of things around human buildings are not really very good. Just like when I travel around the country and I learn about a school that I've never heard of before, I'm surprised. I don't know why. We have thousands and thousands of colleges and universities, and when I hear about one I didn't know about, I shouldn't be surprised. And likewise, I don't know why I'm surprised I shouldn't be when I meet architects or homeowners who say, first are already behind windows. No, it doesn't happen. And uh, in every instance that I've ever gone and talked to them and taking them, even around their own homes, I've shown them evidence where birds have struggled with us. There are feather imprints, there are smudges, there are sometimes feathers even on the glass or blood smear. There's lots of evidence. The bump that I like to point out that writes in the book is not a ghost, you know, trying to inform you that they're moving one room to another. That was probably a bird that had a window that you just don't have any perception of. I like to tell the story, so I forget it, so now it's coming to my mind. There was a guy named Joe Bartell. Best I can tell, now he had a very close friend, Fred Chapman. Fred passed away not too long ago. He had a, a, a struggle with cancer and he lost. But Joe, he moved from Detroit, where these boys were working, to try to prevent birds from flying into Memphis. So Joe moves to Denver, and he joins, like he did in Detroit, the National the Audubon Society chapter there. And he says to them at his first meeting, or whenever he felt comfortable enough to raise the question, he says, uh, what are you all doing about birds and windows? And to the person at the Denver on that site, he said, nothing, it doesn't happen here in Denver. And he says, well, you know, I know this guy in Pennsylvania, and he's claiming that uh, it happens everywhere. And what's more, uh, whatever you have birds and windows, it's probably happening here too. Oh no, they said. I don't know why we're immune, but it doesn't happen in Denver. So he told me this story, and the reason I always like to tell this because I thought this was unbelievably creative on his part. He calls up the professional window washers of Denver. He says, "Ever heard of this problem?" And to the to the company that he contacted, every one of them, all the time, we find dead birds all the time. So again, lots of information regarding the cats. So the cat numbers are sort of compromised, you know, because they're taking birds that are already injured, and they're taking them because of the vulnerable in front of windows. The other thing about cats you have to remember, and again, I'm not putting down cats, we have to really get people to keep them inside and stop taking these animals that they're unintended to take, because all of these man caused mortalities are unintended and unwanted mortality, right? Nobody really wants the animals to die, nobody really wants them to be killed. And so we need to protect them. But the other thing about cats I'd like to point out is that look at in the case of cats, they're like every other predator, they're going to take the less fit members of the population, the vulnerable. Not windows. Windows take indiscriminately the fittest members of the population as well as unfit members. And we have evidence for that. 
the animals that have been abandoned lived several years, gone to South America and back again, and then hit a whip of the day. One of my favorite accounts, which is in the book, talks about an indigo bunting hit a window in Halton County region of Ontario in Maine. It happened to be the home of a bird bander. So the person brought him in, brought that bird in, it's not built cold for over 30 minutes. It seemed to revive to be completely healthy. And so the bird bander put a bracelet on that bird and released it. One year to the day, it hit the very same window. This time it killed itself outright. Here was a bird that went during the springtime to its breeding grounds, fulfilled its breeding, went back to South America, came north again, and got black at the same time. Locally here, which has sort of been an interesting uh, issue too, and Mrs. Brower, which is also had this county book, she lives in Manhattan County and she gives me a call in the 1980s, I guess it was, maybe, maybe the early 1990s. And she says, uh, I got a tale to tell you, and I think you'll be finding this interesting because I've heard about your research study windows. I just put a sunroom on my house a couple of years ago, and I've been keeping records. And every September, the exact same week, the first year the sunroom was up, it killed two dozen chickens. The next year, it killed 10. The next year, it killed seven. The next year, it killed three. And then there was no chickens. And I told her about a famous ornithologist that I had heard in a meeting one time. He worked in Europe. And he captured this bird called the black cat. It's a European world. It's not related to our world, but get this. In his nets, he was capturing these animals. He caught the very same individual five years in a row, not only in the same net, but in the same little of that. Talk about the fidelity to migration, right? And so we all agree, if you take a few of that up, you'll see the chickadees, black eyed chickadees, especially, right? And Carolina chickadees, they're permanent residents, but we just don't know enough about chickadee populations. They're probably populations that do have migratory movements. And in this particular case, going by Mrs. Broward's house, that was probably a population that had migratory movement going through. And the fidelity of their migration went right through the new sunroom that she had put up until there were no more to migrate away. Or those that didn't use that particular fidelity route were saved because they were going someplace else. People say, if they're dying at the level that you and others claim, why don't we see them being taken away in dump trucks? We don't see that because these guys are small and conspicuous and they're easily hidden and consumed. I personally, doing some secret studies, but there's hundreds of flocks flying right into the waves. Where do you find them? Again, you don't. Um, so wherever birds and windows occur, we have these collisions we've been able to document. Um, so why do birds strike windows? Again, like I said earlier, their behavior and the visual systems suggest to us, they just don't see it, right? They hit reflective windows because they're mimicking the facing habitat of the sky and they're thinking that they're flying into real trees, real things. I'd like to tell a story, uh, sadly, uh, Richard Banks, Richard C. Banks. Uh, again, you have to really be sort of involved, I think, in the professional ornithological community to know him, but he's a star, he's a stand-up. And sadly, he just passed away, I think he was like 90-something years old. And he was always a good uh, a colleague to me, and he helped me out. He worked at the uh, Smithsonian Institution, the American Museum of Natural uh, the, the History in, in Washington. And he told me the tale about how, like, they're doing all the time, right? Building another building on the mall down in Washington. And this one was a glass facade, single story building. And when he got off his metro stop to walk to his office in the museum, he would pass by this building that was under construction. And when he would go, it was, again, a big wall of mirrored glass. And he would pick up birds as he went that had flown into that glass, almost seemingly along the length of the building at random. And then they planted maple trees every 30 feet along the row of the windows. And after that, he only found the birds where the maple trees were. And again, I don't know why they don't use ornithologists, but they always use, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out, right? The trees were attracting the animals. The animals saw a reflection of the tree in the window and expected to be able to fly to the next tree and got whacked. This particular window right here, this is a perfectly clear pane. But look, it acts like a mirror on the outside. And that's what happens with windows in human structures throughout the world. A perfectly clear pane covering a darkened space, interior space, will reflect like a mirror on the outside. And so most 
windows, no matter how clear they are, how tinted they are, they're reflective. The ones that aren't are see throughs, like this kind of corridor, or as the Canadians call them, linguists, uh, or atrium, right? Or noise barriers along highways. Their habitat is seen on the other side of the windows and the and fly, fly into the habitat, and they get black because the barriers are trying. This time of the year, right, people put their Christmas trees right next to the window and they attract birds that kill themselves trying to get to the evergreens. This particular planting is just one of you can see the specimen here that died trying to reach this plant over here. You know, <clears throat> what happens to birds when they hit windows is the same thing that happens to humans when they get in bad car accidents. If you're in a bad car accident on the understate and you smash your head against the window, and you're fortunate enough to have an EMT person show up and they call in the helicopter and take you to the emergency room. The first thing they'll do is they'll literally saw your skull cap off so it can be released and the brain will be able to swell, it'll be able to recover, and then they'll suture you back up and you'll live. Most people don't make it that way, and neither do the birds. The brain swell, it breaks the blood brain barrier, and they perish as a result of that. Now, nobody ever told you this your brain is about the consistency of a banana. And so if you squeeze the banana, that would be like squeezing your brain tissue. And when you traumatize that in the skull of yours or in the bird's skull, where there's no place else for it to go, it swells. And this causes the kinds of injuries that you see birds, you know, they're laying on the side, even if they survive the strike or opening and closing their mouths. What they've done is they're causing pressure on their cerebellum, which is one of their most highlighted uh, brain structures that coordinates their movement and activity and breathing and other things. And you can could, you could predict again the kinds of physiological responses that animals would have as they're injured like that. Those homes that we monitored for all those years, they were able to tell us how many times they were died out late and how many times they flew away. And the answer was 50%. And we don't really have any real knowledge about the 50% that fly away and how many of them survive. You know, we're still searching for a way. I've been told uh, the Carnegie Museum out of the Powder Mill near Pittsburgh, they've uh, partner with uh, some rehab centers where they're putting some tags on birds in hopes of trying to follow them after they've recovered and they're released. And so maybe we'll get some information from that study. Uh, and I, to my instead, I tried to get birds that have been hit in hopes that we get some returns. But I don't think anybody ever told you this, right? The, the story again, the sign of the secret is that we spend a lot of money on the government paying and putting bans on birds, but the return on the amount of information we get back is like 4%. It's not really very much. Uh, and that's my big claim about the birds. You know, look at, pay attention to the birds that are dying at the windows. You're going to find out a lot about migration routes and other things. So more about that in a bit. What you're seeing here is another bird that hit pretty hard enough to break the upper and lower mantle. And these are different levels of intracranial energy. And these, these are white crown sparrows. From evidence of almost no bleeding to massive bleeding, they all died out right. We don't need to spend a lot more time. <clears throat> Remembering, of course, that this particular type of human source of mortality is insidious because it's indiscriminate, taking the fittest as well as the unfit members. Look at the small, tiny windows that are available. You know, again, my records show that windows don't have to be big. They don't have to be facades. They can be as small as garage beams, just a couple of inches, and they're death traps for birds. Uh, so there's no season of the year. There's no time of day. They're, you know, the animals are vulnerable, and you would predict that. If this is invisible to them, there's no protected area. I remember writing in my dissertation, because all my records showed that most birds were flying into windows when I asked the question, what time of the day this is occurred in the morning? And I said that the frequency was there, and I've argued that, look at lots of people that have bird fevers, that's when the birds show up, and fasting all night, they show up there near the windows. And I remember a number of years ago, uh, a colleague wrote a paper and said, well, we've dis we, we disproved Clem's density theory. So when I read that, I was surprised because I didn't know I had one. <laughs> and what happened was is that the whole thing was that they were presuming that I was arguing, which I have done in my writing, that the more birds that are in the window, the more opportunity you're going to see strikes and deaths. But what they did was they took a census of the birds 100 meters from the windows. And I said, that's a little foul play. What I'm talking about the close vicinity of the windows is within 30 feet, 10 meters. 
That's a danger zone. So the animals are deceived when they enter the herd. Right? So getting back to the time of day, I wrote that the early morning was most often. And that was the case that most of the information that I had gathered was supported. But then I had a colleague, a guy named uh, uh, man and wife team, Dick and Gene Graver in the University of Illinois. Natural History Survey, Dick worked for Natural History Survey, and his wife, Jean, worked for the University of Illinois. And they had a summer home down, down where my university was, in the very bottom of the state of Illinois. And they would stop by at the museum, which I was uh, working at, and we would chat when they would come to visit during the summertime. And they informed me after I left there, after I had finished my, my, my degree and took the job at Muhlenberg, uh, they wrote me and they said, you know, we had designs and publishing this information, but we thought maybe you could use it more than we did. We don't think we're really going to get around to it. And what it was, was records of times of day that birds here would visit their home. And here was the fascinating part. They were able to document that most of the kills and the strikes occurred at their home between 12 and 1 o'clock. And here I was telling everybody it was likely in the morning. But in their community, they were so astute at keeping track of the birds and their movements is that the flocks of birds would move because in that particular community, just about everybody fed birds. And so they would be at one house, you know, from eight to 10, another house from 10 to 11, another house from 12 to one bears, another house, and each one of the houses were able to document the strike rates at their windows, affiliated with the number of birds that were present. So again, so I had to modify my, uh, my paper to point out that it wasn't just the morning, it could be at other times, depending on the movements of the animals were doing. And we talked earlier about uh, the cities getting the attention instead of residences and homes. Uh, I didn't give you the total. 44% of those 365 to 1 billion birds that are estimated to be killed striking windows, 44% are estimated to occur at homes and residences or small commercial buildings. 56% are estimated to occur at buildings that are four to 11 stories. And less, less than 1% occurs at high rises, multi-story buildings, the skyscrapers. Another sort of little secret too is that everybody makes a big deal, especially the National Audubon Society, and rightfully so, that lights in cities should be turned out during my return to because lots of birds migrate at night. They get to be attracted by the lights that brings them into the danger zone of the city. But here's the thing on clear nights, which most migratory nights offer, the birds fly high enough that they're not influenced by the lights. It's when there's bad weather and the ceiling is low and they're forced to fly lower, the lights like moss will fly, birds are brought in. And like the Fatal Light Awareness Program up in Toronto, who thought originally in the early 1990s when they got established that look at the birds are flying into the buildings, they're dying, that's where we're picking them up. And that's how they got their name, Fatal Light Awareness Program. Well, the deal is, is that studies have revealed that I have predicted, and I tried to convince them, and I think successfully, that no, the birds are not dying at night. They're swirling around these lights, they become exhausted, they flutter, and now they're in the canyons, the glass, and the concrete. That's when they get killed, during the daylight hours. And that's when they pick up their dead birds. And so, yes, lights are important because if the weather is not cooperating and the birds are brought in huge numbers into the cities, again, the density of them for being deceived and, and vulnerable are great. This is just talking about the widow's scan. And what about solutions? I usually break them down into short and long term solutions, right? The short term solutions that I'm talking about are things that have to be done with retrofit, just like these wonderful windows that I'm looking around here at the Nature Center. You, you have dots on them, this is a probably federal framework, right? And so these are patterns that are being placed on these windows. And my experiments have revealed, you know, for us to be successful in keeping birds from striking windows, making them into barriers that they will see and avoid, you have to separate the patterns of the elements by two to four inches, which has been referred to as the two by four rule. And they have those patterns have to uniformly cover the window. And the two by four rule, people often ask, you know, well, you know, why four inches if it's vertical columns and two inches if it's horizontal rows? And here's uh, the line that I use earlier. You know, we're not them, and they're not talking intelligence. But here's my interpretation for what it's worth, right? Which nobody has really said that I'm out of left field about. 
I argue that birds are adapted for giving tree trunks more space than they are branches, which they scoop in between shrubbery and bushes. And so we need to lower the spaces to alert them to the danger for horizontal roads like branches and trees. Now, there's a whole industry that's begun in terms of retrofitting. But the sad part is, many years ago, and there's always a longer story, but I had a relationship with what was once Eastman Kodak Company, you know that company? It's now Eastman Chemical Company. That's it, no Kodak, that's all about. But Eastman Chemical. And they bought out a subsidiary of a film company, external film company in Martinsville, Virginia, called CP Films. And it happened to be that I was interviewed on morning edition in the morning in a like an NPR uh, program. And I said to myself, geez, this is this Dan's luck, right? Here I am, get this opportunity to try to explain this issue to a huge audience on NPR. And those miners got trapped in West Virginia. Who's going to care about birds? I'm concerned about the miners. So is everybody else. But that's the way. Well, it turned out that one of these guys from Sydney Films, an Englishman who was the head of R&D, heard it. And he knew that his film was being placed on buildings and cars and other things were killing birds. And so he called me up and invited me down. And we had a relationship in which he developed some prototypes with me to test what I call the elegant solution. You see UV signals in the two by four pattern or the two by two pattern, which is promoted now simply because hummingbirds have become a little bit more attentive to the spacing and they can try to scoop through the four inches. So they try to close down the spacing. But if you put ultraviolet signals on there that birds see and you don't, I call it the elegant solution because now you don't get any visual noise. You just get the protection of the animals and the people get to see the windows that they originally had them for. And in fact, I got to tell you what I remember, that I remember right now, that when I first started studying this, some very, very prestigious and prominent conservationists said to me, Dan, you go mucking up the way I look out my window, you're going to lose. In other words, anything that I did to suggest that you had to put something on the window to prevent them from being able to see the panoply of the outside world as they currently do, nobody's going to be accepting. Well, that's changed. If there was a many decades when that was the case, but now there's glass manufacturers, which I argue is the long-term solution. The long-term solutions produce products that can be used in the modeling and new construction. And the patterns they put on the windows that are visible to humans and birds are things that are produced by etching and what they call ceramic fit, which is a bonding of ceramic to paint to the, to the glass. And it gives us humans a frost effect, right? But it could be anything. You know, the pattern elements could be lines, it could be diamonds, it could be dots, you know, like these patterns here. And, and, they, and they work, right? And so there is this growing group, the Walker Glass Company in Montreal, uh, Quebec, and uh, Guardian Glass in Michigan, and a number of other companies that make pretty glass are selling it as bird safe glass for remodeling and construction. So that's a, some progress that's being made. And I call it a long term solution because you're dealing with new construction, right? And the life of the building is going to help as opposed to doing it. And now, what's the story with the CP Films people at least with Chemical? They won't produce the film. I found out it's successful. It reduces the number, amount of risk of strike by 95 to 100%. But get this. And, I, and I've gone through this at least 10 iterations. Here's the deal. Every time a new marketing person comes up, my colleague there, the one that helped me, the Englishman, he brings this up to them and says, we had to support Dan. Well, now he's retired, so he's not around to remind them. And at every time that he did remind them, they said, well, you know, our business plan can't handle it. I don't know, nor anybody else in the company who's designing what our return on investment is going to be will tell us how much the bunny and the tree buggers are going to buy. And I would say to them, look at it. Why are you going to worry about that? Look at the look at the local, the state, the provincial, the national parks. They all have visitor centers that are palatially covered with glass. If you just covered them, you know, you'd be you'd be ahead of the game. I had prominent scientists, I had engineers, I had architects write them. Nothing is convinced. So they still have this. And I've tried to convince and was successful many other film manufacturers to produce 
this ultraviolet signaling, but they haven't been able to do it. So what that film, Ingenious as Evil is, did to that film to make it so successful, the company is not interested in sharing it with anybody else. And when he finally retired, he wrote me and he said, you know, Dan, I, I think you have to give up on this. Unless there's some competitor out there that stimulates the company to produce it and sell it, it's probably not going to happen. That's a little disappointing. But maybe some of the other companies will come up with this. So what are some of the other solutions? Barriers, you know, like mosquito netting that works, you know, keep bird from striking. You know about the two by four rule I shared it with you. If you didn't know this, architects number windows by surface area. So surface number one is the one that faces the environment outside. Surface number two is the other side of that pane. If it's a multi-insulated unit, like two or three more panes than surface number three and four, five and six, and on and on and on, right? And so here's the rub. You saw before about the reflections, right? So if you put any pattern in on any surface other than number one, you're lost because it's hidden. So it has to be on surface number one because most windows are reflected and most windows need to be treated to be right. This is a local uh, gentleman. Uh, the, this is Jeff Okopian's attempt to help the birds by producing paracord patterning on the windows. And it's very successful and it's very cheap. And, it, and I highly encourage it. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, it's the answer. I remember giving a talk a number of years ago in Maine at a university. And they were all concerned because some of the films and other things that you could buy to them was expensive. But certainly the rural population people who might have been concerned about this didn't have the money to invest in it. And I said to them, this particular product is cheap. You can actually do it yourself. And Mr. Copeland will do it you know, for you if, if you don't, uh, if you're not able or willing to do it yourself. So it's a, it's a, good, it's a good thing. This is a product called Kaleidoscape. You may or may not have heard about this, but this is, uh, it's been owned by a couple of different companies, but now a, a guy named Jeff Rake, who is a very prominent businessman and successful, he sells this on Amazon, and it's one-way film. And again, if you didn't know anything about the film industry, which I did and I had learned, the elephant, right, in the world about selling, or not only just in the room, about selling films is 3M, the, the Minneapolis company, right? And the 3M company sells this perforated film to be used for advertising on buses. So you go into a bus, you know, you can look out, you don't get any obstruction. But you look at the bus from the outside, you see shading, you know, dresses, diamonds, whatever. And their film is designed to only be on the bus for a couple of weeks, a month, and then they take off. But so they won't sell this film. That's what its purpose was for advertising. They won't sell it for bird protection. But Mr. Matt sells it for his client's fee. And for the friendly sells it because they buy it for you and they create different designs of their own. And, and so it has a great product. And this is what it looks like uh, at the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. This is their education center. And so this is what it looks like when you're looking at the window from the outside. It's got these patterns on it. And here's what it looks like when you're looking out from the inside. You don't see it, right? Now get this, I was at a meeting at Duxon National uh, 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 Research Station not too long ago, and they've taken this issue about bird strikes and kills on their buildings seriously. But they, they were able to convince 3M to give them the film, but they did it in the most, in my humble view, the least aesthetic way. You know, the, think about how this would look, right? As without anything on it other than a white sheet. That's what their buildings, the windows look like. So if somebody put a white sheet over them, but not, not really very attractive. You know, why not just a little matte finish or something so it would blend in with the building? I don't know. What that would be. It works, right? It solves the problem. These are uh, patterns, these are tapes that are doing the same thing. Feather friendly, I think, the dots, which is the same thing that's here. Here's the acid, acid edging. And here is a corridor on the Real Merkel campus. It's, uh, it's a frit. And again, when you look at it from the outside, it's a little dull. Now, when this was installed in 2007, after the installation, no birds hit these windows in this corridor. But the rest of the building that is conventional plastic, one to two dozen birds die every year. So you can see sort of the natural um, this is often touted as being not working, uh, angry. When I first, uh, and, I, and I did a study about this, I, I did some experiments. I thought originally, my hypothesis was that birds are not likely to fly into the desert and fly the ground, right? 
put itself on the ground. And, uh, but it didn't work out. Birds were flying into those angled windows that reflected the ground. But again, why should I have been surprised? Right? Well, it's like at the ground all the time, I think. But what happened was, is that the experiment revealed that fewer birds were hurt flying into these angled windows. And the reason was because it deflected their momentum. And it didn't hit them as hard and it didn't cause the injury that others would. If you didn't know this, in the 1950s, uh, there were a group of European scientists who started a field called ethology, the biological study of behavior. And in 1973, three of them, Carl von Frisch, uh, Nico Timber, and uh, Conrad Bermans, were given the Nobel Prize. Now, the Nobel Prizes are not given. Uh, to scientists for information about animals. It's only for advancement of humans and human knowledge. But these guys were given the Nobel Prize because of the work and what it revealed regarding some of the most powerful things that we humans deal with and shape our lives. How do we come to our faiths? How do we maintain it? How do we learn and guide our children through where they're getting it? What sets our character? In line. Well, studying these other animals revealed that for us humans and the power of that message and what it meant for interpretation, not from psychology or other, other things as well, earned them, according to the Nobel Committee, the Nobel Prize in 1973. And one of the studies that one of them did was to show that silhouettes, as they interpreted a hawk silhouette, was innately causing fear in other organisms. And then you know, this was published and everybody sort of assumed it. And the guy who was the head of the Smithsonian, a guy named Dylan Whitley at the time, read that paper, had a design of a hawk silhouette printed up and sold in the gift shop of the Smithsonian Institution to prevent birds from flying into windows. So he put it in the upper left hand corner, have it stooping down so it's going to look like it's going to pounce on prey and it'll frighten your bird. Well, that was the claim. That was the first experiment I ever did. And the window that had the hawk silhouette at nine hit the window. The one that had nothing on it as the patrol at 12. It wasn't really very significant. It didn't really do a good job. And not only that, some years later, one of the students of Berenz and Buttrish and Timur did a study that showed that it wasn't the shape, it wasn't the, it wasn't the shape of the hawk that caused the fright. Because he was able to demonstrate through a series of rather elegant experiments that it's the shape that is the least exposed to the animals that causes the fear. So what they used in his experiment was, you know, like if you take a silhouette of a goose that has a long neck, right, and a short tail, right, and it's moving so the long neck is going forward. If you turn it around and have the sort of short tail and the long, I mean, the, the short, yeah, the short head for what was the tail for the goose, and now the long uh, tail, which was the neck of the goose, and that's going forward. It looks like a hawk, right? So he was able to show that if he made the goose silhouette the rare flyover to the animals that were his subjects, they got frightened. It was whatever was rare to them. So it wasn't, it was sort of concept oriented, right? It really wasn't innately fearful of the hawk. It was innately fearful of rarity and difference. So sort of mean. And there's another story about that. This guy who did this study, he's now. Gosh, he's in his 80s. He's, he was a professor at the University of Maryland for many, many years, and he moved back to Austria, which is where his home was. And he contacted me uh, years later about this very study. And he wanted to use my work in the windows and, and the experiments that I did because he was re, uh, uh, revisiting some of his experiments. And that, again, that's a nice story. Yeah, one key. There, are civil, there are decals that you can buy. The trouble is that these decals, like, uh, uh, alert, you know, window alert, and uh, and some of these others that have rather bizarre uh, visual ones here um, that have the they're expensive, and so they only work really effectively if you do the same thing that you did with these dots, separate by two to four inches. But if you do that, it prices them sort of out of control. So they tell everybody who buys their decals and could separate them by as much as three feet. That happened out in Brookhaven, Long Island. Uh, but then, what was it? One of the big uh, life insurance companies sold their campus to the township of Brookhaven. 
And they were very proud. They had bought all these maple leaves and they put them on their windows and they said, we had all these tragedies, kills all the time. And we put these leaves up and they all went away. And I said, yeah, well, you know, were you following the distances, you know, the two by four? Oh, no, no, we just use it what it says on the package. They have to be separated by two to three feet. And so I said, well, I, you know, I'm convinced. Can we take, I went out there and they invited me, I visited, we walked around, we found all kinds of dead animals, you know, skeletons, birds. You know, it's not going to work unless you separate these things so that you uniformly kept the mental and the animals can recognize this area as a barrier to you. This is a bird feeder study that we did showing, it seems counterintuitive, the closer your bird feeder is to your window, the more lives you'll save. A bird only needs to be a little over a meter, 3.3 uh, feet away, and it can build up enough momentum to kill itself all right. And so if you put it within a meter, then the bird can come and go, and even if it strikes the window, it does so with less momentum to bird itself. Um, people have written, you know, warriors have written, well, Clem says you can have it within three feet or greater than 30 feet. No, the 30 feet part, I, I, my experiment is stopping because I couldn't really imagine people putting bird feeders beyond 30 feet. You know, I put the feeder on so they can see the birds. 30 feet is right out of it. So uh, the bottom line is that if the feeder attracts animals so that it enters that danger zone, 10 meters, 30 feet, it's, uh, it's still a potential hazard. Okay, here's the elegant solution. This is what ultraviolet patterns look like on a window. Here's a window in sunlight, and here's a window in shade. Again, the ultraviolet reflection from the sun is not as powerful in the shade or early in the morning and dawn, and thus it's the most powerful at noontime, by right? this direct sunlight thing, but it, it's preventive, it works. All right, so. That's the overview. How are we doing on time? It's 7.59. Pardon me? 7.59. Okay. okay. Well, we got started a little late. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'll just, again, most of what I'm going to talk to you now about is uh, what's, in the, what's in the book, you know, in terms of the summary. So this first preface, uh, I'm talking about the purpose of the book, and that is every citizen on the planet needs to be convinced. And my whole hope is that Unlike what's happened at the day, we're going to be able to try to capture a critical mass of the general public that's going to impress and really force our building professionals, our architects, and our developers to take this seriously and make our buildings safe for the animals who care so much about. In the prologue, I talked a little bit about me and uh, how I got here 47 years of studying. This was my doctoral dissertation, as I showed you earlier, and this is just a graph. This shows you what's happened over the years and the number of papers that have been written to document more and more about this. And again, most of these are young scientists. Uh, in chapter one, I'm talking about who makes it last, how much of it. We didn't know this. There are about five manufacturers that are located the world over that make glass from scratch. There are thousands upon thousands of other glass manufacturers that buy this raw product and change it in ways that make their product unique. And they sell it, right? But there's only five really that make it from the sand and the oxygen. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, windows started replacing the human buildings to about 290 current at the time, and the problem had killed those ever since. Right? And in chapter two, I'm talking about why the birds hit windows here. We're talking about the fact that they're invisible to it. That's the way they behave. They just don't see it. Yeah, an unkind way and a short little flippant response when people say, well, why do they do it? Well, they, they just don't see it. Stupid. They might be stupid. You might think they're stupid, but they just don't see it. It's no fault of their own. They just don't have the ability. And here we already talked about the relative attrition rate. And let's just talk about chapter three and chapter four. I provide evidence. Uh, all the uh, observational data that I've collected, all the, and that's another thing too, I get, I've been saying in class today, it's sort of a shame that Dr. Fauci is always talking on the TV about data being collected for this, data being collected for that. Why doesn't he just say that it's, you know, for information? It might not go over so quietly to all those people who find whatever he says and whatever anybody else says to be offensive. Just 
have with things. So here, we talk about the experiments, we talk about the, how I came to determine the two by four rule and so on. And here I talk about what I already shared with you about the debts of the risk. Um, and then the valuing of the debt, you know, I mean, people are as, as good as the deterrents are going to spreading and accumulating, there's still going to be many who are not going to believe it. You probably think it's a conspiracy theory. Whatever it is, birds are going to die. So turning those birds into using it so they get used to studying form and function and being attentive to the migratory groups that I said earlier. Like, for example, here, paying attention to the birds, they can sparrows and, and rock papers are like, you know, they're, they're a great find. They're, they're pretty rare. Uh, you could find them, but not without a great deal of luck and, and searching. But when I went for the first time in 2005 to, to Chicago and they were showing me around, I was really shocked and amazed how, my, how many living sparrows and rock papers are being killed. We're talking, you know, 50 animals in one building, all dying, found on the sills. So clearly, right, like as far as the brown papers do, go through the Midwest, go through the Chicago area, uh, far more than they do here on the East Coast in terms of their migratory travels. The other thing, too, that uh, I'd like to point out, sort of a genius thing, you know, for many years, we never knew where the endangered species curvos were for their boundaries. We know it's in the Bahamas now, and we knew it before I came up with this little ditty of mine. But if you took a straight edge and put it in the breeding grounds of northern Michigan for the curtain of workers, and you run it through the kill sites where curtain of workers have died flying into windows in Ohio, it takes you right to the, to the non breeding uh, area in the Bahamas where the curtain of workers are. So if people again were attentive to that, they probably would have been able to discover this Bahama non breeding grounds a lot earlier. And the other thing is, is that I'd like to point out is that in El Salvador, right, in the country, it's El Salvador, the city, this uh, uh, white bellied emperor, which is a type of hummingbird. That was the first time it was ever recorded in that country. It was killed in a window, right? So being attentive to collecting specimens and being around windows can have value for our natural history of public standards. And of course, the service, if you're a bird interest person, you know that pollination, uh, burying of acorns and other seeds, helping to plant the forests, the symbols, you know, that, uh, you know, like I can point out, of course, what's the double piece, right? If you know anything about behavior, about dumps, they're anything but peaceful. <laughs> so, but you know, to us, it's a simple way we, we use it. So, there's other things too. So, a lot of aesthetic things and a lot of value, a lot of cultural relationship. Um, this chapter, one of the reviewers, if you go to the website for this book, I, I like it. His name is Paul Basich. He writes a, a, a sort of a blog, he and a partner of his from uh, Massachusetts Audubon. And uh, he reviewed the, the book. To help him, you know, to give some critical feedback. And uh, he writes in his review, you know, if you're an architect or somebody else, you're going to be tempted to go to chapter nine and find out the solutions. But don't do that. He says, read chapter eight, because that's the history of the sort of little tales I'm going to tell you about, which I hope is human interest. Here's the two by four year about solving the problem. And chapter 10 is talking about legal. You know, again, you probably are all aware, but we have federal. We have state, we have provincial, we have municipal laws that require bird state buildings. Or worse, maybe you've never heard this, but the Fish and Wildlife Service will tell you every time they get a chance. If you're any way connected with the unintentional kill of a single protected bird in America, and all of them are protected except the three species that have been imported, you're subject to fine and even imprisonment. But who in the wildlife service, who's enforcing and arrest every citizen by law who's responsible for the death of the bird? It's called incidental take. It's a big ticket item that's being discussed right now uh, before Congress. And uh, the former administration did away with it. The current administration is trying to bring it back because it has value. And my argument has never been that you don't need to arrest every citizen, but how about using the law to stop the 200 or 300 birds that die every day? At some of the convention centers in some of the cities, and we should have them. Anyway, that's what this chapter talks about the legal aspects. And uh, this particular chapter, uh, I give examples of letters you can write to media people, letters you can write to your congressman, letters you can write to architects and developers to stimulate their 
interest and give them some information as to why they should act on making our buildings safe for us. And also give an example of an ordinance, how you can use a municipality to write an ordinance to protect words by forcing the architects to build buildings under state themselves. And this last chapter, I won't go through much of it, but this is about all I want to share with you an ending on this, but is a little tale about some of my technical reviewers who said, you know, Dan, you you have to end this book with some little twist, something that will capture the reader's attention. So this is what I came up with. I don't know if it's any good, but you don't have to read all that, I'll just tell it to you. I said, think about a population. It could be birds, it could be anything, really. And think about the fact that there's a force that's killing off members of that population. It's taking the leaders as well as the common citizens. It's totally indiscriminate. And the people or the individuals who are within this population, they have no way of knowing or determining what this force is and why their neighbors and their leaders are, are disappearing. Along comes an alien visitor and sees what the members of the population cannot. They see and they can deal with the force and they can eliminate it and they can protect the population. So I end by saying, think about the forces, the windows, and think about the saviors as the humans. Remembering that these birds really, they have no place, they have no way of protecting themselves. We're their only hope. And so that's the whole point. That's the whole point of the book. And I don't know why I have to do this today, but I have to point out to the publisher. I really don't give a rat's tail about how much I'm selling books or how much we go in terms of the monetary gain. I don't really expect to get anything, but the whole thing is done for the cause. Again, unintended, unwanted deaths that we can solve. And finally, this isn't climate change. There isn't a big conference to get people together to try to figure it out and solve it. We really don't need it. We know what the solution is, and we could do it tomorrow if we had the will and the intent. And so that's what I'm pleading for. I'm pleading for people to get the will, do the action, and stop this. And again, if you didn't see it, if I didn't mention it earlier, let me remind you that a famous study quoted by just about everybody today that's interested in bird conservation, published in 2019 in Science by a whole host of authors, of which I was not invited, but it's okay. I'm not offended. And what did it say? From 1970 to the present, three billion individual birds have been lost to the North American bird population. That's 29%, close to 30%. And windows, it turns out, the authors identify it as one of the principal causes. So maybe we can work together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interest. And if I went over, I will understand if I'm going to be back. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still proud of my motion.